so welcome to the first night. There's two lectures. There's a field day. So lecture one, uh, we're going to talk about roping up again really quick. We're just going to demonstrate it once. And then we'll demonstrate also very quickly a three to one. We will demonstrate a five to one being built off of a three to one. Then you guys will go back into your teams and you'll do a five to one from all three positions. We'll have you strip it back down to a three to one. Then we'll come back. We'll demonstrate a six to one off of a three to one. You guys will go into your teams. You'll do it from all three positions. Um, we'll also spend some time talking about what to do if you're at the victim end. I had mentioned this in hams. I think it's worth mentioning again now. Um, a crevasse rescue situation is an emergency situation. So all of the typical mountaineering emergency rules apply. You know, so for example, first thing you do is make sure you're safe. Whether you're the victim and you're in there and you're going, first thing I'm doing is, am I hurt? Or you're arresting that teammate's fall and the first thing you're doing is getting up and going, am I OK? It's always about your safety first, because if you compound injury upon injury, then your entire team gets really screwed. Um, the other thing I would mention is that the number one cause of death in a crevasse fall situation is hypothermia. Oftentimes, that's compounded by trauma or loss of blood, but it is usually not the trauma itself that kills someone in a crevasse fall. Because actually, quite frankly, unless you're in a two-person team, most of the time that fall is arrested. It's more about how slow or hard or difficult it becomes in extricating that person. So um, it's really important to get people out and get people out fast. Um, we'll encourage you on the field day to try hauling on just a three to one. Um, to see just how hard it is. There's too much friction. There's too much rope drag. There's too much rope cutting into the lip to make it effective. So hence the five and six to one. One of the other large dangers of crevasse rescue is that almost inevitably, if it's not because of the rope cut, it's because the snow bridge collapsed when you were partway on it. There's almost always some sort of ceiling. And one of the major risks is hauling someone into that ceiling and continuing to haul. And you can crush them, which has happened, you, um, particularly in Canada, where they use six to one haul systems as a default because they tend to be isolated when they climb. Um, so we'll be emphasizing communication. Communication is a big deal in crevasse rescue, just like it is in any emergency situation. We would encourage all of you, although it's not a part of this particular class because we want you to experience the difficulty, we would encourage all of you to have radios when you go onto glaciated terrain, um, invaluable tool, so that you can actually communicate with the climber. It's also gonna save you time, you know, rather than you getting a system semi set up and going to the lip and the guy going, yeah, I just need to be lowered. And all you're doing is, you know, putting the rope onto a munter right off the anchor, just lowering them. And it saves everybody a heck of a lot of time. So the sooner that you can establish contact, the better. If I could give you one word of advice to take away from the class, bring a radio. OK. Any of the instructors want to come up and demonstrate roping into a system with three people on a kiwi coil? So why do we keep kiwi coils? Extra rope to work with. That's a major advantage, particularly when you see how we build a six to one. Six to one really can use the extra rope. Why else do we keep a kiwi coil? Shorten up the team. Shorten up the team, which makes what easier and what harder? There's a trade-off. Rope, management. rope management's easier. Um, so big swings might be hard mm -hmm. with short rope. Yep. Those are both very accurate answers. The only one I would add is that on a shorter rope, communication is easier. So a longer rope gives you more reaction time if you're navigating a pretty serious set of crevasses and you are honestly worried about a fall um, and you've got two teams so you've got a lot of manpower, I'd probably take the coils out and travel with them uncoiled. If I was by myself, I'd probably never, you know, just me and my two buddies, I'd probably never take the coils out because I want the extra rope. Um, if I'm in a whiteout, I would, t even though I can't see anything, I have no idea what the crevasse danger is, I'd probably go with the coils in so that I'm short and I can talk to each other or try. Those are a couple of the major trade-offs. But for the purpose of this class, yes, the coil becomes helpful for, um, for having the extra rope for building these uh, multiple systems. Um, you'll also find that it's invaluable to have the extra rope if once we get into mid-climber falls, because one person has to build the entire hull system on one side by themselves. And so you need a lot of rope. So. All right, gang. So what have we got here? Three-person rope team. 
All right, so talk us through it. You just clipped in the end of the rope into one of your locking carabiners. Okay, so what have we done with our kiwi coil here, gang? Uh, Excellent. So that, if you pull on the climbing end of the rope, it will tug on the harness yep. and not your shoulder, which is sometimes you'll see people just do the kiwi coil and then wrap around and it goes straight out off the shoulder. Pretty bad way to climb. Brandon will be our victim and we will quickly establish a three to one haul system. All right, Brandon falls. I got, got him. I got him. So in the field, Jason would really be digging in his feet and trying to get comfortable because he's going to be holding that for a long time and it's not going to be easy. You're having a thicket. And I like to go about four feet or so beyond the fallen climb. Or the why do we go, why do we go below the fallen, the uh, the anchor, me, the anchor. Why do we build the actual anchor below the middle person? Yeah, so we're closer to the direction of pull, which is one of the fundamental laws of anchor building. That's probably the biggest reason. There's another reason. That if we did build this uh, rope with equidistant knots, by Jeff going below me, he's guaranteed that the amount of rope uh, that we will have from up from the anchor is longer than the rope down from the anchor, which means we will have enough rope to build some sort of haul system for sure. All right, so what are we doing? Slipping my anchor system off that, and I'm just gonna simplify here. I'm putting my first locker in. It's basically a catch basin locker in case he should lose his grip and start sliding down the hill. We would be stopped by this. I'm lazy. Backup <laughs> in. What will become a backup thing? Anchor on there with the inner. And now I'm going to start putting a prussic on the fallen climber's rope. Did we talk to you about chest harnesses and hams? I think we did, and why it is very bad as a middle person to be pre-clipped into your chest harness. Yeah. I see nods in the affirmative. Anyone not know what I'm talking about? Now is the time to speak up if you don't. Okay. So I'm putting a second locker on the uh, inner side of the rope. And So at this point, we can uh, let uh, Jason test the anchor, make sure uh, my prosthetic and the anchor system is pulled in. So to John's earlier point, after I got into a rest, I kicked my feet. My feet are really the foundation of, this, of my body as an anchor, and so my feet go up last. So I'm going to come up and push up. I'm going to keep the axe in. I'm going to keep in points as long as I can, and then the axe comes up, and then I come up and then I can move my feet. Your feet are the, really the base of this. It's holding, excellent. All right. I've gotta go about coming out of the system. So, I'm going to tether in. And Jeff's tying a catastrophe backup knot. Correct. I'm gonna try and stay out of his way, so typically I'm gonna to go top shelf because we're going to have enough garbage on the anchor. So, so once I'm tethered, then I can come out. I would undo my Prusix. I would undo this knot because we have another catastrophe knot. All right, so Jeff's going to make his way down. So he's going to take my ax and I am going to build the self-tending part of the ratchet Prusix. So again, if I had, uh, had placed my prussix on my harness, <laughs> I would be taking the slack out of this rope and try to manage it at the same time. It's a nice new stiff rope. 
Because this is going to protect me as I make, as I make my way down. So he's come tight to the anchor. One of the things that I can do as Jeff heads down is he's clipped through. So here's his knot on the, uh, the catastrophe knot. This was my original backup. I don't want that friction in the system anymore. It's become redundant. Yes. So I can take him out. It also frees up a beaner for me to do whatever with. So I'm making my way down. I check on the pole and climber. Brandon, you there? Yeah, I'm okay, but I need to pull it out. All right, well, we're coming out. Two, I'm going to show you two ways very quickly. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the former of using a, any type of um, bucket device. This happens to be an ATC guide. Um, I get a lot of questions about belay devices and glacier travel. And I guess the best way I would answer it is this. Unless I was going someplace really high and really cold, I would almost always take some sort of bucket guide device. It's simply more versatile. You can do a lot more with it. If you're going to run into anything that's technical, um, I would certainly bring it. But if you go on, for example, 8,000 meter peaks with fixed, a lot of fixed line, they will require you to bring a figure eight. And the reason that they will do that is because frozen rope, particularly rope that's connected at both ends, you can manipulate through a figure eight device much more easily than you can any type of bucket device. So it depends on the type of climb that you're doing. I will say that I have seen this self-tending component, this, this safety for the Prusik on an ATC guide fail numerous times. In other words, the Prusik just gets sucked up into the device and then the whole system jams up. I have never seen it fail running through a figure eight. But you guys have probably, because most of you carry bucket devices or that type of thing, um, you've probably seen this. So you go always from rope to device to pulley to anchor. And that will never change even when we change the, um, the type of device. So again, make sure, particularly if you're on a Magic X, that you get both strands, that you really are top shelf on this. And you can see now, when, the, when he lets the system go, the Prusik theoretically should only back up as far as the device. Now to do it with a figure eight is just as simple. It's still the same order of setup. You're gonna go just both strands through the small hole on your figure eight. So you take a bite, you push it through, so you go to to, from, from rope through device to pulley to anchor. And your device can just float free because it will never move further back than the pulley or further forward eventually than the prusik. So it's not going to run down the rope or anything like that. So that's, now you have a quote unquote self tending ratchet prusik. All right, so Jeff has. Right, as, as uh, Jason's been building the. Uh, the ratchet prusik up there. I put the hauling prusik on down below, and that's with a prusik knot tied to the fallen climber's rope with a non locking beaner going to the second pulley in the system. And as you can see, this is what forms the 3 1 Z haul. It goes this way. So, Jeff, are you ready to haul? Give me a moment yes, if you're ready. Uh, I'll be ready to when you take the safety knot. So I take his safety knot out. He's going to get some slack in the system, which he needs to pull through. And now we're ready to haul. And in this case, again, if I had been attached to my harness using my prussics, it would be tight to this. And I would use my prussics so that I can put on my harness so I can get the full weight, my full weight into the pulling process. And I give Brandon a yell. I prepared the lip, by the way, with two ice axes, so it helps to keep the rope from penetrating into the lip of the cross. Brandon, we're ready to haul. Okay. There we go. And so I haul to the point where the pulley is near the anchor system. And then I, my way back down. I extend the ratchet prussic so we don't lose that work. Or Any resets. Should be familiar to all of you. And pop 
brand new comes out of the glass. Yeah. He was just he was fine all Now time. before we break you into your teams to rope up, and again, you won't have to haul, you just have to set it up because we're going to keep building off of it. This is where I want to talk about um, what to do as a victim. Again, hypothermia is the danger. So as a victim, I had already mentioned the first thing that you do is you self-assess. You've fallen in the crevasse, and the first thing you're doing is assessing yourself for injuries. Um, you're going to be fairly well adrenalized. So it's going to take something visual, not just, oh, I feel OK. Feeling OK is a great starting point. But also, you know, check out your limbs. You're not going to be able to check out your face or what have you, although you should try and figure out if you're cut or anything. Um, but with that much adrenaline going, if you have, you know, like a, a broken wrist or something, you might, you might not even notice it. Um, but you do a self-assessment. Walk me through what is the process of getting yourself access to your pack and getting clothes on. Walk me, talk me through it. What am I doing? I'm dangling in space. What do I do? Unclip your waist belt first. Yes. There's actually a step that you should do before that. Get right up. Yeah, if you have to, absolutely get right. So how would you go about doing that? So I'm turtled now too. I'm feet up. What am I doing? Pull the rope and clip it. If you're already in your chest harness, great. You probably haven't turtled. Um, if you have, if you don't clip through your chest harness, which I actually prefer not to for numerous reasons, um, yes, you're going to haul yard on that rope and you've got to clip your harness in and now you're sort of hands free. Okay, now what's the next step? It's still before getting your waist belt off. Check your tether. Check your, make sure you're actually attached to your pack. To get your pack tethered. Yes, why? It's so that as you begin to climb, it drops below, it adds to the weight, the weight of the line as you ascend. Yep, it helps you ascend. It also becomes a two to one on the pack weight. So if you end up do, needing a haul, um, you're going to pop up now before your pack. It's going to be easier to pull that pack up because you're going to have a two to one mechanical advantage to haul it up. So that's the recommended way. Some people clip it to, if they, particularly if they have a rear gear loop, some people clip it to that, but I, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't clip it to the, the rope between your prussics, because you need your prussics to be able to get beyond it, so between your prussics and your harness. All right, so you've got your pack clipped. Now what? It was get the waist belt off first. Why? What happens if I take my shoulder straps off first? It's going to drop below you. Yes. That sounds like a bad situation. I've experienced that on a field day. My first advanced crevasse rescue seminar as a student, it kind of sucked. Um, so yes, you got to take the waist belt off first that so you've got on your shoulder strap. So now you swing it around. My pack's in front of me. Okay, what am I doing? In your jacket. Anything in particular about jackets? Parka, Parka absolutely. Stay warm. What else about jackets? Something with a hood. Something with a hood. You're going to want a hood. Why are you going to want a hood? Yeah. So what else are you you're gonna so you want a hood because you're gonna be sloughing a bunch of snow off of you eventually, and I'll explain why in a minute. So what else are you gonna want? You're sloughing a bunch of snow on you. Face mask? Poncho or a shell. Yes, a shell. Yes, face mask. If if you have goggles in your pack, put them on. Um, they will protect your eyes a lot better than your sunglasses. Get on your, if you don't have a beanie because it was a hot day on the glacier, put your beanie on. So basically it's get everything you can on to stay warm and then shells on top. You're obviously not going to be able to get to your legs very well. So it's a you know, hood and shell and beanie and goggles. Gloves are, a, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're going to be having to manipulate a lot, then don't bother putting your mittens on. If you're hurt and you're going to need a haul, put your mittens on. All right, so you've got all this clothing on. Now what are you do doing as a victim? See if you can climb out. Yeah, and, I, and climb most loosely, like lowercase c. Climb out might be physically climb the wall. It might be climb the rope. It might be, oh, there's, if I get lowered five feet, I can see a ramp out the side of the crevasse. So is there a way to extricate yourself without needing a hull system? There's an, two advantages to being able to get yourself out. What are the two advantages? Save energy. Save energy. Okay, there's three advantages. Stay 
stay warm. That's the big one. You're working, so you're going to stay warm. And the other one is typically faster, which also kind of goes in with saved energy. Okay, so you have to determine that you know this is what I need from my team. I need them to wait and build a solid anchor because I'm going to climb out. I need them to create a hull system because I'm hurt and I can't get out. Um, or I need them to lower me. And so get ready to communicate that. Let's assume that you're going to need a haul out. What's the next thing you're looking at then if you need a haul? What do you need to be able to communicate to your team? How far you have to go? You're estimating how far you have to go so that you can give your team that information. And your estimate will get better the more you get hauled up. So, oh, I think I'm 25 feet down. Yeah, you went deep. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you used it, so if most, on a 60 meter rope with three people and into five knots, so that means four sections, you're about 12, what, you're at 15 meters per section, right? No, 12 and a half, because you're in five. So yeah, you used two thirds of your rope length. That kind of sucks. <laughs> but okay, you got 25 feet. So you need to be able to tell them that. What else do you might, might you need to tell them about the environment around the hall? What the lip looks like. Yep. All three of those are good information. How high I have to go, what the lip, do I have a ceiling or not, and what this it, situation looks around the lip. You know, snow bridge looks really weak. It's only about three feet wide. No, it looks like I just found a weak spot. There's a lot of snow everywhere. You know, I don't know. You're trying to give them as much information as possible so that they can keep themselves safe. Okay. So that's the victim. Um, anyone here not know how to ascend a rope? So everyone has. Okay, so you know the procedure to ascend the rope. Okay. Obviously, ascending the rope, while it seems simpler, is harder than climbing out. If you can climb out and move the prussic up with you as kind of a catastrophe, a tether, a lot easier way to go. Okay, questions about victim. Yep. So you're in a crevasse. You're thinking you're going to climb out. You've got these folks are setting up a three-way or five-way, six-way. Mm -hmm. um, what if you don't have a radio? Mm -hmm. um, do you start your activities? Or yes. How do you, how you, do you, communicate? you start climbing anyway. Okay. Unless, I give you one big caveat, unless. Unless to climb out, you're going to have to aid climb. Because if you're going to have to aid climb, you're basically anchoring yourself in a bunch of different locations. And them hauling on you while you're anchored is going to be a bad situation for you. But if you're going to free climb it in any way, or if you're going to send the rope, then absolutely start climbing. All you're going to do is close that distance faster, and you're going to enable communication quicker. So ascending the rope is aid climbing, by the way. Yeah, it is. It's true. But um, one concern I had about that is, well, what if you're, um, you haven't built the anchor yet, transferred away to the anchor? So are you stressing out the middle person holding your fall? And the answer is not really, because there's so much friction in the system between the middle person and you that as you ascend the rope, um, you know, you're adding a little bit of force to them, but, but um, it, it saves you time and it keeps you warm and everything else adjacent to you. And if you move that prussic with you, even if you're free climbing, even if you fall, you're going to fall the length of your prussic, which if you're extending is not going to be much. So you're not really going to take a whipper onto that rope and onto the anchor up on the slope either, as long as you're doing that correctly. If you were doing it like you were a lead climb and you're just clipping pro as you go, then yeah, if you took a fall or if you don't clip anything at all or you don't move your prussic at all, you could drop a lot and yeah, that might cause this person, the person who's holding you to go. But if you're moving that prussic along, there's not gonna be you know, fall factor one type stuff, so. All right, other victim questions. Yep. If the victim's five feet above a bridge and can go up a ramp and out, how do you lower them? We will show you how to do that. So part of the reason why we wanted you to bring extra long cordelet today was so that you can attach, rather than this prussic, in fact, let's do that right now because we'll have you set it up um, this way from now until you're done with your mountaineering career. So rather than this prussic, the ratchet prussic, thank you, Jeff, for this. I asked you guys to bring 
long either runners or cordelette, right? I ask you to bring two of them. One is for your anchor, which you may or may not need. I happen to like having a really long um, runner for flexibility. So right now all I've got is the safety line to the middle person. Thank you. So rather than do a Prusik knot on a small on a small uh, cordelette, you can either have one long piece of cord, which is what we used last year to teach people so that they could see it. It's a little neater. Um, but that's not the most useful tool in the world, just having a long piece of cord. Having a really big runner is something you can use for multiple things. You can create anchors. You can sling rocks later. Um, you can create a foot press out of it if you needed to. So having a big long piece of cord has multiple purposes. One purpose is this. I'm going to simply tie a clem heist. Clem heist works really well on, um, with webbing or runners. If you are using cordelette rather than a webbing or runner, uh, a prusik would be a little bit better. Probably be using a thin rope on a glacier, so you, you need to wrap it a few more times than the regular prusik. So, Clem Heist, right? And I'm going to attach it to the anchor with a muncher mule knot. So, I tie my muncher. Some sort of big HMS beaner is really good for this. But any locker, and this does have to be a locker, um, will do. I don't need to worry about tightening it yet. All I really care about is that this thing isn't too far away from me. And now I'm going to tie my mule. So I need one twist and a big bite through the twist. my backup overhand. If I'm feeling particularly paranoid, I can clip a beaner through that backup. So just pretend both strands of that runner is a single, single strand. Yep. Right? And now I can load it. And all this is, you're never going to lower anyone on this. You're going to lower someone on the rope. So eventually I'm going to do the same thing with the rope. If I'm going to lower them, I'm going to put a munter mule in temporarily and I'm going to take out this one. The only reason that I'm doing this is it's releasable. With a, a Prusik just on a cordelette and it's weighted, I can't unweight that in order to free it off the rope so that I can lower someone down. This I can. So I'll attach the rope with another Munter mule. It won't be weighted yet. I'll undo this knot. There'll be a little bit of give in the system. It will weight the rope. Now I can take the Munter mule out. Now it's just a Munter and I can lower them. Make sense? So. That's how we're about to disperse you into your teams to get roped up and build a three to one. When you build your three to one, build a munter mule for your anchor point. Okay? We're going to do five to one. Okay, so normally there would be a second person here. We'll take them out for the purpose of being able to view. So we're at our three to one system. I'm way down here. They tell me I'm ready to haul. Take the catastrophe knot out. I try and haul and I, I can't. It's too much friction in the system. Brandon's been eating way too much. Too much beer. So we need more mechanical advantage. We're teaching a five to one and a six to one in this class. Uh, there's multiple ways to build both of those systems. This isn't the only five to one. This isn't the only six to one. We teach these two systems because they have kind of inverse strengths and weaknesses. So the five to one that we're about to teach you has you hauling towards the victim, which is useful for being able to haul and communicate at the same time. But for it does require that the area around the fall is relatively secure, which isn't always the case. The six to one system that we teach you, um, you're hauling back towards the anchor, uh, which 
mitigates that problem of safety of the, you know, if this is an unsafe area, that's, the snow bridge is really weak, then I can haul back up at the anchor while still, while still maintaining mechanical advantage. Also, the typical, the six to one that we teach here has particularly low um, impact on the anchor in terms of force. So again, you can learn different six to one haul configurations and different five to one haul configurations. They all have strengths and weaknesses, this, but this is why we choose the two that we teach you in this particular class. So we're gonna start with a five to one. All right, so I'm gonna press it back up because I've decided that we're gonna build a five to one. And one of the things we'll talk about on the last lecture night is that your team should des decide what your default system is. So it may be a five to one, it may be a six to one, maybe a three to one, depending on how many people you have. But we'll talk more about the whys and the what fors about that on the last night. So, but let's say that your team has decided that five to one is your default system. So I'm gonna come back up. Now I, wanna th I want you to think about strands as numbers. So strand one goes from the victim to the anchor. Strand two comes from the anchor down to the Z pulley. And this is Zan, uh, strand three. So what I'm going to do is take one of our additional shorty prussics, and I'm gonna attach it to strand two. You can either use a prussic knot, or you can use a clem heist as if you're gonna pull against it this way. So you know how a clem heist the loop is at the top, the direction that you're going. So the top is towards the anchor. And it will be in the six to one also if you do a clem heist. So I tie a clem heist to strand two. Now if you were gonna do, in fact we'll take it apart right now for a second because it's worth mentioning. So if you were gonna do a five to one as a default because you've taken ACRS and you know that a three to one haul system doesn't typically actually work, then the rule of thumb is you want your pulley, if you only have one pulley, you want it to be as close to the haul line as possible. That's where it produces the most friction, uh, the system. And so that is where you want to reduce that friction by having a pulley. So in this case, if I knew that ahead of time, I wouldn't have built anything around the ratchet. I just would have had a beaner, right? So then, now disadvantage of that is the second person now, the person who stays by the anchor has to tend this. There's no self-tending involved, right? So, that, but that's what we decided as a team, aware of all those trade-offs, that's what we we're gonna do. So I will simply put a pulley here onto my, so again, strand two, a new prusik, strand three, I'm still outside of the system myself, right? Because I can put myself on belay and come back here and establish communication. For, again, for example, if we weren't building a three to one first, I didn't already establish communication with him. I went straight to a five, which you'll see the next lecture, how you go straight to it. And I come down here and I can establish communication. He needs a haul and I start hauling. So now I'm hauling, and what you'll see is the two pulleys are moving towards each other, right? So go ahead and give me a um, mic if you could uh, reset the ratchet. Here. Thanks, Jeff. Are you going to be able to haul by hand, or is that? Yeah, actually you can. Um, you'll generally get so much friction that you might need additional help, in which case a five to one isn't going to work for you. So that's another one of those things to think about, right? So you can't pull with your prusik? I could pull with my prusik to a point. When I first got up there, I could pull with my prusik down to here, but then I get, you know, the crevasse becomes the, the limiting factor. So if I'm gonna reset, again, I have to keep myself on belay. So I'm gonna come back up to here. I'm gonna take both pulleys, I'm sorry, both prussics up. And then if, I, if, these were, if this was really far up system, I've been doing this for a while, then I would come back down to this. And as I belay myself down, I would move this pulley with me also. You have to create slack in the system first, so you have to go up first and then down. And then I can haul again.
So there you go. All it is is an additional prusik on line two to redirect your haul line. You have pulleys going in opposite directions, so the reset's a little more complicated. It's another disadvantage of this particular system. Another disadvantage is that you have to be able to haul on your own. Big advantage is you can communicate. I can monitor if there's a big shelf. I'm not having to come back and check every uh, couple minutes. I can actually watch while I'm hauling them up. Um, so there are advantages to this system as well. So that's the five to one. So now I'm, we're going to ask you guys to break into groups. You will practice the five to one from all three positions. After you've practiced the five to one from all system, from all positions, just take the five to one out. So really all you're doing is removing this part of your system. So now I'm back to a three to one because we're going to use the three to one again as a base for your six to one. So go, pr so practice your five to one, strip it back down to a three to one, reconvene. Okay, so six to one off of a three. So back to our three to one system. I try and haul. I can't, not working. So again, I come back up, but now this time our team has decided that we're going to build six to one systems. This is where your Kiwi coil comes in super handy. This and mid climber falls, which we'll deal with next, uh, next lecture. Um, all right. So I come back up to the anchor. And what I'm going to do is take the knot that you never take out, right? The end of the rope. And I'm going to move it into the anchor. I'm just going to put it behind your foot here. OK. Nope. Just let me put it on there. There you go. So I'm going to have to come out of the system. If you're on a, you know, a bad slope or something like that and you're really worried about slipping, it's worth clipping yourself in. If it's relatively flat where you are, it's probably not worth the time. Because I'm going to come completely out except for my prusik. So now I'm going to come up tight to the anchor. I'm outside the system at this point because I'm as far to the end of the rope as I possibly can be. And what I'm going to end up building here is you have a three to one and I'm going to attach a drop C pulley to the three to one system. So a three piggybacked with a two, there's your three times two is your six, which is where you get your six to one. So I've got strand one, again, that goes from the fallen climber up to the ratchet pulley. Strand two that goes down to the Z pulley and strand three right now is our haul line. I'm going to attach to the haul line with a drop C. So taking a bite in front of me, I'm pressing myself down off of the anchor. I'm coming inside. I know this feels counterintuitive. I'm still outside the system because I'm as close to the end of the rope as possible, but I'm coming inside this loop. And this is where I'm going to attach like this. So again, if you have a pulley, furthest outside the system as possible is the place where you get the most benefit. I'm going to be hauling in this direction, so I want my Clem Heist loop pointed that way. I can try, you can't haul off of this line. This is now your haul line. I can try and haul as I go. It probably would work, but I would recommend just coming all the way back to the anchor. And now I have a new haul line. So to reset this, again, my, my second person would straighten the ratchet prusik. I would belay myself off of the end of the rope. I would take both prusiks with me, which gets a little tricky because I have to pull slack through the now haul line. And 
And if I need to, I can continue to extend on the original Z pulley. Press it back. Find the haul line and haul. And that is your six to one. So a six to one, the way that we teach it, six to one has, I guess you could say the advantage, depending on the situation, of being able to haul up at the anchor. So if you're in a particularly dangerous situation, either because of five to one, you're hauling towards the crevasse. So if either that slope, or not slope, that punch point in the crevasse is riddled, it looks dangerous, probably don't want to do five to one because you can't be down there. Um, if you're on a pretty severe slope, I'd probably want to be anchored in. Another reason to do a six. Um, the mechanical advantage is greater. So, you know, if you're still ha worried about having enough force, then a six to one um, provides more mechanical advantage. And lastly, it's a minor detail um, in most circumstances, but I guess in some it wouldn't. This particular configuration is very low stress on the anchor because you're not, you're not piggybacking another force on the anchor because this is fixed. And so you get a lot more distribution of tension down on that end and on the climber than you do on the anchor itself, which is part of why the Canadian Guide Services teach a six to one. There's, there's two reasons the Canadian Guide Services go six to one as their default system. That's one, it's less tension on the anchor. The second is that, as I mentioned earlier, in Canada, you're oftentimes climbing you know, off by yourself, very small teams, not a, it's not like going to Rainier and having 500 of your closest friends there who can just muscle up a rope. There's probably, if you're out there with three people, you're probably the only three people out there. And so they go with something that's got a lot of mechanical advantage. Um, that being said, you know, the, I mentioned the story of hauling someone into the lip and killing them. That happened in Canada on a six to one system. You had two big guys who were hauling a relatively petite woman and so much mechanical advantage that they couldn't feel the difference in hauling weight versus hauling her into the lip. It's also um, part of the reason that fire services, now keep in mind, fire services don't have to deal with things like rope cut into the glacier and things like that, so there's less friction in their systems. But fire services won't use anything over a five to one for that reason. They wanna feel when the rescue victim is being impeded by something. And if you get enough mechanical advantage, you simply can't feel it and you'll continue to haul and you could end up crushing that person. So we actually don't teach a nine to one, which is two Z's piggybacked for, that, for exactly that reason. You don't need nine to one mechanical advantage. In fact, it might be a detriment to have that much. You know, the reason this is advanced crevasse rescue as opposed to more three to one practice is that A, we want you guys to get down the mechanics of these other systems, but we want you to understand the trade-offs between five to one, six to one, three to one, just a drop C2. So you've seen a drop C, I could just drop a C, you attach one point of the anchor, you drop a C down to the victim, they clip it to their harness, I have a two to one. A straight haul, if you have 50 of your closest friends on the mountain with you, why set up a system at all? Someone's down there maintaining communication and everyone else is just tugging or climbing yourself out. There is no perfect system. There is a better system for your circumstance. So you need to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your circumstance in order to make a decision as to what system you're gonna use. Those are all the conversations that you should be having with your team before you go on a serious climb. You have to understand what systems work in what situations better. I think you're gonna talk about that more in the next class, but that, that point is really important. Probably the best thing to do is just agree, based on your team beforehand, agree, um, probably go right to the five to one, so stay even pulley, and, uh, and you know, maybe give the, make sure the end person has two pulleys so we can build the system right there, or she and then uh, practice it. A lot. Like if you're going to Denali or, uh, or something more technical, you, uh, you don't want to try to be figuring out things in the field. <laughs> right. But on the other hand, the situation changes in the field too, so sometimes you need to make adjustments even if you've got mm -hmm. a three way. Maybe for some reason you need more leverage or whatever. So we good on the six? All right, go forth and conquer.